Welcome. Joining us today is Robert Daly. Daly is the director of the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States at the Wilson Center. He has served as a diplomat in Beijing, as the interpreter for President Jimmy Carter, and he's well known in China for his appearance on the TV series, Beijing or in New York. We're really excited to have him with us. Um, one of the things that you said uh, in a talk in Ireland, I think it was last month, um, you talked talk, about- I said, how, Oh, in Ireland. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about how um, something like a pandemic could be something that reminds us, like between the US and China, that we have a great deal of common concerns and kind of contextualize the animosity of a relationship in like the broader context of solving global problems. Uh, I thought that was really interesting because I mean, you look at that quote in light of like what's happened now and I mean, it's nuts. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on like how the response actually went and what, what it looked like? Sure, well, uh, in the talk that you're referring to, I said that I was very worried that uh, US-China relations, the broad direction that we took, would be driven not by a rational expert process, a typical policy proce uh, process that looks at histories and uh, capabilities, intentions, and especially national interests. I was afraid that there would not be a process, but that it would be driven by crisis instead. And there are a couple of different kinds of crises uh, that all could drive US-China relations, some good, some bad. I guess there's nothing indifferent. Um, there's the Sputnik crisis in which the United States uh, is suddenly aware, uh, as we were when the Soviets launched the Sputnik satellite, that we had fallen behind in key areas and we were inspired by Sputnik. Uh, we sort of pulled up our bootstraps and we invested and we won the space race. So that's a possibility. Another type of crisis is the Suez crisis that the UK went through, where you are suddenly forced to confront the fact uh, that your power has declined, probably irrevocably, and you need to change your strategic concepts. And then we've got something like a 9-11 crisis. And I think we almost saw this uh, went with uh, Iran with the assassination several months ago. And what I'm concerned about with something like a 9-11 crisis is that you have uh, some event happening in the world, obviously 9-11 very important, very dramatic, which distracts the United States because of sudden violence, because of a uh, peak in threat perceptions. China, um, for a lot of cultural reasons that aren't hard to understand, really has difficulty cooperating with the United States when it feels that it's also under attack from the United States. Uh, and the United States, for its part, it's not clear that we can cooperate with China when we do see uh, under Xi Jinping a China that is more aggressive internationally, far more repressive domestically, when uh, the Chinese government is also involved, as have some, and some American leaders have been involved in spreading conspiracy theories, and especially when we see China through a blend of propaganda, much of which is false, and the genuine provision of public goods internationally. We see China wanting to benefit coming out of the pandemic and increase its comprehensive national power at America's expense. In other words, we know we have common interests, we know we should cooperate, but strategic distrust is so deep that we don't seem capable of it and distrust is deepening. Where is this dynamic of distrust and negative relationships leading to? Well, this, we don't know. You know, it's, it's taking the, the form now of a debate about who will lead the international system. Uh, I'm not sure that's quite the way to phrase it uh, so far. I don't believe that uh, China is capable of global leadership uh, in the way that America has exercised it uh, since World War II and especially since the end of the Cold War. I don't think China's ready. I don't think China is capable. And I don't think that China is welcome uh, by the rest of the world, even as clearly China's influence and importance has grown. What I see and what really worries me uh, is in the area of what's come to be called decoupling. And as you say, this, this preceded pandemic. So before the pandemic, we had already seen through the trade war, uh, decoupling of supply chains, strong pressure, and this was already uh, in, in effect, before the pandemic, American companies, not only American companies, some Chinese companies, other companies were leaving China uh, 
and the supply chains were being to a degree, it was only partial, um, but disintegrated from each other. That supply chain decoupling is now going to accelerate because of strong concerns from the United States and the rest of the world that they are too dependent on China for medical equipment, for medicines, and for precursor materials and reagents that go into medicines. Depending on what aspect of this market you look at, the United States is dependent on China for 80 to 95% of its medicines. We're highly dependent on China for rare earths, which are essential to our defense supply chain, as well as to technology supply chains. So you're going to see more uh, decoupling on the supply chain side. We also see decoupling preceding the pandemic on the tech side. And this you've probably been following. Uh, the notion that companies like Huawei, ZTE, uh, DJI, a Shenzhen-based company that has, I think, a 70% uh, global share in photographic drones, that having these companies embedded in American telecom systems or in American society at all constitutes a security threat to the United States. Uh, the fear is that through these systems, China can spy on the United States. It can steal more intellectual property. There's also a fear that China could use uh, their telecom equipment to shut down um, American infrastructure in, in times of war. And then there's a more global concern, which is growing, that uh, any collection of data from the United States by China will increase uh, China's capabilities in the realm of artificial intelligence because data is the oil of artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence it is widely believed is the key technology uh, that the mastery of which will give not only hard power, military power, but economic power, soft power, and normative power to whichever country has the best AI systems. So there's tech decoupling in addition to, to supply chain decoupling. Uh, but then there's a third form of decoupling that we are beginning to see, which is decoupling of financial systems, uh, cutting um, China's stock market off from American investment and vice versa. There are moves, and I'm talking about legislation in Congress, to delist Chinese companies that are listed on the American stock market because Chinese companies, by and large, don't provide the kinds of clear, transparent, audited, and auditable information to potential investors that other companies are required to provide in order to list on the stock exchanges. And this is largely true. This is largely true. So we see pressure to get Chinese companies delisted. There is at the same time pressure to get uh, American large uh, personnel systems like that of the state of California, most states of the military, disinvested from the Chinese stock market. We have limited ability to invest in China. American companies can't list on the Chinese stock markets at all, so there's a real lack of reciprocity here. But through index funds, a, number of, a large number of Americans have their retirement funds invested in part in Chinese equities. And the argument from Congress goes, um, Americans shouldn't be investing in corporations that feed the Chinese military that feel that feed the Chinese surveillance state and techno totalitarianism and that build Chinese power vis a vis the United States, we should disaggregate our financial systems. China, for its part, has some of these concerns. That's one of the reasons uh, that it's never really been very open to American companies listing in China. Uh, Chinese economy remains far more closed to the American economy. China is also very concerned about the global dominance of the dollar as the world's primary. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, reserve currency, and very concerned about America's ability through the dollar and through the SWIFT system, which is the most widely used system for global payments. America is able to leverage that to carry out secondary sanctions on companies and nations that do things America doesn't like. A lot of countries are bothered by this, China among them. So there's pressure to decouple financially, supply chain, and also technologically, but it's worse than that. And this is your question, where are we going? We've also seen a decoupling of US, China, and global civil society, non-governmental organizations with all that they do. And that's been driven primarily by the Chinese side with its new laws about foreign NGOs, uh, which are designed to greatly limit their influence within China. 
because China sees international NGOs, as does Russia, as does India to a degree, as a kind of US government fifth column, which is there uh, through philanthropy to actually spread values and ideas uh, that are intrinsic to the Western system and that soften China up. So China has driven out civil society. That's all very concerning, but now what we see through the pandemic is what I see as the final decoupling, which really brings the US and China to a breaking point. And this is of concern to universities. And it's going to be of concern to students like you at Brown, who are probably imagining having careers related to China or to the US and China in various ways. And many of you may want to have something along the lines that my generation has been able to have, which is a very rich, rewarding careers in which you sort of move back and forth between China and the United States as a, as a, as a global citizen and do things that benefit uh, both countries and that are also personally very rewarding. And these are great careers and I'm glad that many of you are hoping to have them. I also think it's gonna be harder to get them as decoupling comes because what we're seeing now, if you think of the tit for tat expulsions of journalists between the United States and China. If you think of China's desire, uh, regularly articulated by Xi Jinping, for China to tell its own story. What does that mean? It means that China wants to be the only author of Chinese narratives worldwide. And they want to have Chinese narratives, and by this I really mean Chinese Communist Party controlled narratives, accepted on China's own terms, uncritically. This, this is what you know, Xi Jinping would, would like to see. This is why he said, all of the Chinese media are surnamed party, you serve the party. So increasingly at the level of information systems, media, traditional media, social media, uh, but also the entertainment industry, also gaming, which is very important. We see the politicization of information systems and the pulling apart of information systems such that you have not only um, different facts, but such that the United States and China invoke different authorities in support of facts. Increasingly, the US and China, when they think about each other, when they think about their power in the world, they invoke different facts. They invoke different versions of history, different narratives, and it's increasingly difficult for them to speak to each other. And this is really serious stuff. And to give you an analogy, which is imperfect, maybe too broad, but to drive the point home, think about the United States with the red-blue divides and how difficult it has been to have a respectful, coherent discussion across those divides. It's very hard to have that conversation when you don't invoke logic in the same way, when you don't recognize when an argument has been made or one, when you look to different facts and different histories, when the red and blue states have you know, Fox News on the one hand and MSNBC on the other, we live in different information universes and even Americans are deeply alienated from each other. Now, you know, carry out the analogy to China. Imagine that the red and blue states in America with all of the real animus and distrust there also had separate territories and standing armies and both wanted to control the entire nation. What does that look like? So that's what this information decoupling threatens to do. And it's compounded by decoupling of knowledge systems, universities, laboratories, multinational organizations increasingly pulling apart from each other such that our innovators, our thinkers who could be working together you know, and, and advancing human progress together are increasingly going to be unable to do this. And it's that final decoupling of information and knowledge systems, which I think results in a long-term mutual alienation from each other, which comes close to something like a Cold War, which is what I've been resisting and I still resist, Cold War. It's, there are a number of ways in which that's not accurate. It's getting harder to resist as we become alienated from each other, even in our knowledge and information systems, and as both countries gradually and without sufficient reflection re-embrace doctrines of mutual assured destruction and move toward an arms race that comprises not only nukes, but cyber weapons and space weapons, which we haven't even begun to truly understand.
I think a, a lot of people have been saying how the conflict between the U.S. and China is only going to focus on economics and can only focus on economics. I mean, what what would it take for it to kind of go to that next level? I mean, like, what are the signs well, out for it? So we're going to be preparing for the next level. We're doing that now in developing things like hypersonic glide reentry vehicles, which can bring you know, multiple warheads, independently targetable warheads into each other's territory uh, at speeds that there's no way of, of defending against. And we're beginning to look at, again, weaponization of space, weaponization of the internet. On the bright side, let's look at the other side of the, of the ledger, because you asked a very good question, you know, what would it take? Um, on the good news side, there aren't very many, well, while we have some conflicting interests, particularly in the Western Pacific, where we have incommensurate views of what a stable security architecture should look like. But there aren't many causes belli, there aren't very many issues that would actually have us uh, shooting at each other, that would lead to conflict. Both nations to date know that they mustn't go to war. You know, World War III is Armageddon, that's, that's the end of show. And I think that both nations know that. So, there aren't very many issues that could have us in a shooting war, um, even if as we prepare for one. Uh, the most likely would be Taiwan, uh, and, but that's an issue in which Beijing and Washington and, and Taiwan itself, we have long experience in, in managing that fairly well. It's getting harder to manage, it's getting trickier, uh, but it's a watched pot that we're very careful not to let boil. And so this is why I, I don't want to speak of a Cold War and why I prefer to say mutual alienation, <clears throat> which is itself costly and, and very worrisome because there aren't many issues that would likely bring us into conflict in the short term. At the same time, because of this alienation, because of the coronavirus and because of the trade war and for a bunch of other reasons, you really see for the first time now uh, broad and deep anger and dislike in China toward the U.S. and in the U.S. toward China. This is very worrisome. The U.S. and China over you know, the past 45 years, our relationship has been through a lot of ups and downs. And there's always been a lot of competition and there have been disagreements, including on core issues of values. But through all of that, the Chinese people have never been anti-American. This is very clear to anybody who visits China. You hear about all these problems, you go to China, and <clears throat> for the most part, the Chinese have always been just wonderful hosts, friendly, internationally minded, um, not anti-American, very knowledgeable about and interested in Chinese uh, American culture and American history, um, very flexible, very highly adaptive. And Americans also have not been anti-Chinese. There's always been a a great deal of fascination between these two countries. There's sort of a, a fascination, frustration dynamic, but fascination and just liking have always predominated. Can we sustain that under the current circumstances and when we are so alienated from each other? Because when you have the degree of alienation that we seem to be headed for, we tend to live in echo chambers. We tend to only hear uh, our own voices, we tend to legitimize anger and suspicion, dis distrust is the engine of our relationship. And it becomes much easier um, to view the other nation as uh, more remote, and I don't, the word is overused, but as very other. You know, it, be it becomes easier to dehumanize the other nation through propaganda. And as you know from reading history, that attitude can be a precursor to violence. And clearly those kinds of attitudes, X kinds of distrust, are one of the reasons that we're finding it so hard to cooperate now, even when we're confronted with this pandemic, which threatens us all in the same way. We can't agree on the basic narrative of the pandemic. Again, different information systems, different facts, different histories, and that's preventing us uh, from saving lives together now. That doesn't bode well if we move toward conflict in the South China Sea or the East China Sea or in Taiwan. Again, none of which is highly likely, uh, but it becomes more thinkable.
What role can diplomacy play in sort of fostering communications between the U.S. and China? I know you worked as a foreign so service officer for a long time. Right. Well, uh, you know, diplomats and diplomacy reflect leadership. And we have leadership, we have very problematic leadership, in my view, in both countries now. Uh, both countries are eschewing traditional diplomacy and to varying degrees uh, have ignored and disabled the expert diplomatic bureaucracy in both nations. On the Chinese side, uh, we see sanction given to what are called the wolf warrior diplomats, people like Zhao Lijian at the foreign ministry, people like Liu Xiaoming, China's ambassador to the UK, um, but China's ambassadors to Canada. We see uh, a diplomatic style in China that has always been cautious, has always been couched in the traditional indirect uh, courtesies of traditional diplomacy, now becoming very aggressive. And we see Chinese ambassadors using Twitter which of course is it's, it's ironic because it's outlawed in China. Uh, and we see them using op-eds to really very aggressively attack local populations and leaders around the world. There's a more aggressive style, uh, which is very off-putting and is harming China's diplomacy. On the American side too, we see real changes. We've also seen American diplomats uh, using Twitter and using other kinds of media in ways that have offended their host countries. We've seen this, for example, Germany is, is a um, primary example of this. I think we've been very well served. Uh, both China's ambassador to the US, Sui Tian Kai, and the American ambassador to China, Governor Terry Branstad, they're traditionalists and they've both been very careful to try to keep conversation going, to keep their discourse reasonable uh, in traditional ways. Thank goodness, you know, both of them have not become wolf warrior diplomats, but they're the exception, not the rule. We also see, and I've spoken with a number of European diplomats, Southeast Asian diplomats, all over the world, uh, countries feel bullied behind the scenes by both Chinese and American diplomats who insist that their own narratives be accepted and increasingly want countries to pick sides between the United States and China, which they don't want to do. On the American side, uh, we see a new fairly well-funded effort at the State Department uh, in the public diplomacy side of the State Department. There's a funded effort uh, to put American China experts, diplomats who know China, in embassies all over the world to draw attention to the ways that China is coercing and influencing other countries, basically to call out um, Chinese perfidy and Chinese sort of dirty tricks. Now, that's always a part of diplomacy. This, this, this always happens. You always warn countries you know, about the bad guy, right? And China does the same thing. But what's different and new and worrisome is that a very high percentage of American public diplomacy efforts are going into attacking China instead of telling America's story, presenting American culture, uh, presenting you know, nuanced discussion about the United States and global relations. When I was in public diplomacy as a diplomat, and I served under uh, sort of the last years of Reagan and the early years of, of Bush one in China, and the way we were trained, we were instructed to tell America's story warts and all. That was the idea. And what warts and all meant was um, you wouldn't shy away from criticisms of America. There was confidence that if you presented America in its totality, in its complexity, together with the errors it made, together with its hypocrisy, together with the fact that America was imperfect and always evolving, there was confidence that if you had a, an adult, open, critical discussion of the United States with people from other countries, and if you brought them to America and let them view America freely and ask questions, there was confidence that they would come away more impressed than otherwise even if they were critical, which is of course the way most Americans are. And a lot of money used to go into presenting America in that way. Now those aspects of presenting American arguments, values, culture, intellectuals, instead of doing that, 
we're putting the money into sort of skulking around, you know, on the other side of the curtain saying, ooh, you know, look out for these Chinese, boy, you know, they're tricky. Um, and again, there's always some of that in diplomacy, but it's become a focus. Um, and I believe that that's a strategy of weakness. I think we need to be, you know, big-minded, big-hearted, and we need to be have deep pockets, chest out, and present the United States as we always have, warts and all, because we have a better argument. We have a more attractive system. Um, even with the various ways we've been bleeding soft power since 2016. So we need to re-enable and reinvest in diplomacy in both sides, uh, but not in the wolf warrior mode. China has a really hard time telling its story internationally in a way that wins it friends, that wins it soft power and what it calls discursive power, the power to, to control the discourse, the power to control uh, the discussion of China, which of course you can't do. America can't control the international discussion about America. You just, you just can't do it. Um, but China has a particularly hard time with it because uh, it controls information domestically very, very tightly, under Xi Jinping especially tightly. It's, it's really been repressive and has gone you know, backward. The only legitimate voice is the voice of the Communist Party, which is always correct and never makes mistakes and is scientific and all these other wonderful things. Um, but China doesn't tolerate any criticism of that, any blowback domestically. Well, now the party is accustomed to speaking with authority in that way, in a declarative way, rather than making an argument based on logic, based on facts, based on an appeal to the best instincts. China does, the, the CCP doesn't engage itself in a discussion of its policies at home, and it's incapable of doing it abroad. Because if they do it abroad, if they are what they call Neijin, why, Sung, if they have a tight discourse domestically, but a free and open discourse, give and take, criticism, the calling out of nonsense internationally, the Chinese will see it and they won't accept it. So China, the CCP, because of its attitudes toward propaganda and discourse, is stuck speaking to the rest of the world the way that it speaks to its own people. And the rest of the world doesn't have to put up with that. You can laugh in their faces. You can say you're wrong. You, you, can, you can speak to them with anger and disrespect. You can present other arguments. You can challenge facts. And they don't know how to deal with this because that's not how they deal with discourse at home and so they're left sort of yelling and saying, no, you're wrong. You need to adjust and have a proper outlook and basically think what we want you to think. And this is an unappealing message. Now, obviously, America has its own soft power and discursive problems right now as well. Um, so this is not to say that, that, that America gets everything right. As I said, we've been, we've been bleeding soft power uh, for the past three years. I'm afraid that that, too, has probably accelerated because of our management of the coronavirus. Just to uh, conclude on a more positive note, uh, we have a decent amount of um, students uh, at Brown from China. So we want to know if you have message to take home for these students, whether they want to um, have a career in both China and the States or for students who are interested in learning more about the relations between US and China. Do you have any message for them to take I, home? A couple of messages. Um, this has mostly been a fairly pessimistic talk. There are a couple of bright spots, or if not bright spots, uh, reasons for hope. One is multilateralism. One of the big mistakes you can make in talking about US-China relations is to speak as though we're the only two nations in the world. And when you do that, um, you, you, it's hard to avoid the conclusion that we're headed for conflict. But of course, we're not the only two nations in the world. Neither country can get most of what it wants, all of what it wants. Uh, both, country, both countries are very much constrained by a whole number of factors that we won't go into. And I think it's multilateralism that is the best, has the best chance of saving the United States and China from their own worst instincts. And we've also got another strength, and that is people in both countries who take an interest in the other country, who learn the language, the culture, the history, who make friends, who build binational institutions, and who struggle with these issues. They're really hard. In particular, one of our greatest strengths uh, are Chinese Americans of all sorts, including those who grew up in China and are naturalized here, including people who are here for seven generations. 
people who understand both cultures, including the large number of students from China who are being educated in the United States or have been educated in the United States, you guys play an important role. Being educated in the United States, of course, doesn't mean that you agree with every American position. You can wear blue jeans and like hip hop and eat McDonald's hamburgers or whatever you like about America. And that doesn't mean you agree with America about the South China Sea, of course not. But the advantage, the great contribution that all of you can make in, in, in China studies at places like Brown, whether you're from China or from the United States or from other countries, is that people who are educated like you, while you're going to be critical of both countries, your education and your experience inoculates you against coarse propaganda and demonization of the other. I'm sure that your time in America for the Chinese students has made you critical of many things about the United States. And it's probably made you cherish more of the things that you really love about China. And this is typical experience. You go overseas and you become more critical of the things about your own country that you dislike but you become, you value even more highly the things that you've always enjoyed about your own country. This is a typical experience. But what it means is that nobody's going to be able to demonize the United States to the Chinese students in your program or demonize China to the American students in your program because you know too much. You know that the other country is human and that it's complex and that there are wonderful things about it. And so the challenge for you is how can you bring that insight that appreciation of nuance and complexity, that understanding of the humanity of the other, your desire to find common cause and work together, how can you bring that to bear when the relationship between these two nations is increasingly contentious and they're increasingly alienated from each other? That is going to be harder for your generation than it was for mine. But it's also much more important because the costs of getting this relationship wrong are unthinkably high. And so it, it matters. What you've done matters. And thinking about how you're going to walk this line I just described throughout your career, that's an important challenge. And it's something that I look forward to continuing to discuss with you. How can you bring your insights and your educations to bear when the relationship is still deteriorating and hasn't found bottom yet? You can make a difference. I don't know how. I, I, there's no simple answer to any of this stuff. It's going to be an unfolding over decades. But this is also one of the greatest challenges that we faced in our history. You guys are privileged by your bilingualism, by your educations, to contribute to one of the greatest discussions in human history. As the U.S. and China grind up against each other in all these different ways, some of which are worrisome and some of which are wonderful and enriching, how can you guide that? such that it is more positive than otherwise. That's your challenge.